Hello, everybody, and welcome to a conversation with Mehrsa Baradaran, the author of Color of Money, Black Banks, and Racial Wealth Gap. My name is Oluwa Tony Logadato, and I'm a junior public policy major here at the University of Maryland. As a junior under undergraduate student, I serve as Director of Advocacy for Black Students in Public Policy, or BSIP, and I'm also a member of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Task Force, or DIB. Thank you, and I would like to turn over to Mr. Baker, former County Exec Executive of Prince George's County and President and CEO of Baker Strategy Group. Thank you, thank you, and, and welcome everybody to tonight's conversation. Um, I'm really excited about tonight's conversation. Um, uh, I want to, uh, you know, on behalf of uh, the University of Maryland School of Public Policy, uh, Black Friday, and our chief financial uh, sponsor, AT&T, uh, Professor Bharadaram, I want to welcome you to, uh, uh, to Maryland and to this discussion tonight. Uh, just briefly, um, I, I discovered Professor Bharadaram's book um, about six months ago. I was looking for... Um, some new ways of thinking about the issues that were happening around the country, uh, whether social justice, health disparity, or wealth inequality. And I really were looking for ways that elected uh, executive leaders could address those issues and think about them, and more importantly, do something about them. And so in my research, um, I came across a, pre a presentation that uh, Professor Baradaran uh, gave to the Economic Policy Institute and I was fascinated by the presentation. And so I ordered the book. I found the book amazing. And I said to myself, I wish I had read this book when I was county executive. And actually, I don't know if you remember, Professor, but you talked about Prince George's County in your presentation that day. Um, and so I, I, I decided I wanted everyone to read this book. It became on my Christmas list. Uh, so I... I wanted county executives, mayors, and uh, county judges, and especially what we're going through in today's time, to be able to have a discussion around these difficult conversations and uncomfortable conversations uh, with everybody, not just people of color, but with everyone. And so uh, I wanted to have the opportunity for you to present the book, especially to those who are part of the cohort that we have in our Excel program with the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Because the idea of the cohort is to give these executives new ways of thinking about these issues. Because let's face it, at the local level is really where, you know, to use an old cliche, where the rubber hits the road. Uh, that's where citizens expect, you know, because they see these mayors, they see these county judges, they see these legislators every day. That's where they expect change to happen. And so what we wanted to have is this great conversation and ideas uh, for them. And I, I found the book fascinating and I wanted to, uh, as many people as possible, especially those in executive leadership uh, to hear about it, to talk about it, to think about it um, because that's where real and systemic change is gonna happen at the local uh, city, county and state le level. So uh, I'm excited about what we're gonna talk about tonight. And uh, before I introduce uh, your, our chief uh, financial uh, uh, sponsor for this, this evening, I do want to just say to Aisha Washington, who made it possible that we brought you here. I've been talking about you for six months, and she made it happen. So I'm excited. Uh, I want to thank Aisha Washington for doing that and, and bringing the speaker tonight. So let me introduce. Uh, Latara Harris, who is from AT&T, our chief sponsor, uh, who's the regional director in external and legislative affairs for DC, Maryland, and uh, Virginia. Uh, Latara, you have a lot of things going on, so I'm gonna have, give you the chance to say a few words. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. County Executive, and thank you all so much for uh, your attention tonight. Um, I'm just absolutely pleased to be here to bring greetings on behalf of our employees throughout the country. Um, I love seeing all of those that are coming up in the uh, in the chat. I see uh, Anne Arundel County, hello, <laughs> County Executive Pittman, and I saw Westchester, New York, keep them in. We love to see all of the energy that's around the table. Um, so I just thank you, um, Mr. County Executive, for your vision around uh, and your help with uh, all of this work. and. 
uh, Dean Orr, absolutely uh, tremendous work that you're doing in bringing this um, very important conversation uh, to the stage in a major way. And, certain, and certainly, Ms. Washington, for all you're doing. And Tony, I love public policy majors. I'm telling you, you have my heart. That's what I do for a living and you're in for a real treat for yourself. So um, I just, again, I wanted to thank you all on behalf of at and I'm based here in Washington, DC. These conversations we know for our company are critical to our communities, um, for people that are trying to figure out a way and really bringing that, you know, the, the, the truth and the energy that Professor Baradaran is going to bring is something that we value tremendously. Um, I've been with the company now, I'll be celebrating, I guess, eight years next, um, next week. I've had interactions with the county executive, very fair county executive. He has been tremendous for our county. I'm a Prince George's County resident, undergraduate at Bowie, and I did my master's uh, in, at the University of Maryland, my MBA. So again, I thank you all so much for the opportunity to be, hey, Delaware, <laughs> and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and uh, have, a, have a fantastic event. Thank you. Thank you, Latara, Rashern, and Tony. You've gotten us kicked off uh, just so. Uh, I'm Bob Orr, the Dean of the School of Public Policy, and it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone this evening. Um, I will be briefly introducing our speaker this evening, and I say briefly because I really want to hear from her. Um, uh, Professor Mersa Baradaran is a force in social justice, and it gives me great pleasure to call a professor a force in social justice. It, 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 when you conceive of academia in the right way, uh, you can make stuff happen. And our guest tonight is doing exactly that. Professor Baradaran is a professor of law at uh, UC Irvine Law School. Um, I would love to say that she uh, fits in a public policy school even better than a law school, but we won't get into that, uh, that, that issue tonight. Um, Professor Baradaran's work is broad. It, is, um, uh, it has made an impact in the policy community. Professor Baradaran is sought out uh, not only for her writings and her presentations, but she has testified many times before Congress, various committees. Uh, she is a regular on the media. Uh, I think she is what I like to call an action academic. Um, uh, I, I would never say that about someone when they're going up for tenure, but it's the highest compliment I can give to a professor is that you are an action academic, uh, Professor Baradaran, and you've chosen a topic that cuts right to the heart of what we are about at the School of Public Policy, the nexus of race issues, of social justice issues, and of policy. So I welcome you tonight, and uh, we could not be happier to have you. The floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Uh, these are very, very kind introductions. And let me uh, just, I usually don't kind of talk about the, the writing of a book or a research project. And I did um, initially start this project as an academic exercise in, I wanted to use, uh, you know, it was a broader project. You use black banks or immigrant banks, or just, just a case study in, in the history of black banking to show things that I um, had already kind of discussed in my academic research prior to this, which is the, the tensions in, you know, the Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian versions of community banking versus public policy. And my, my theory of the case had always been that public policy and federal, um, local, state interventions in policy matter much more than the market actors themselves. And I wanted to use this as, a, as an example of, 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 of showing that. And as I started digging into this research, I got angrier and angrier and angrier. I, I, I um, cannot imagine someone having done the, done, you know, seen, gone into the archives and read this stuff and, and not um, writing a, a polemic. And I tried as, as hard as I could to, to bring it down to footnote and to cite, but if you could feel my um, rage uh, in this book, um, you know, then, then you, you get where, how, how it was written because it really, um, uh, I, I did not anticipate um, to find um, such, <laughs> purposeful and repeated and constant um, 
uh, blocking of uh, the, the efforts, the good efforts of the entrepreneurs and the black bankers um, historically. And so, so I, uh, the book is about the racial wealth gap. And it, 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 you know, again, it started out as an exercise uh, for black banks and then it eventually uh, went to being about um, the racial wealth gap. So I will um, go through some, some data real quick. And um, uh, you know, this is the racial wealth gap today. And I wanna talk about how the role of credit policies, economic theories and, and banking policy in creating and perpetuating it. And to explore also why the racial wealth gap hasn't abated over time. So in 1865, uh, the black community had controlled 0.5% of the nation's wealth. This is at the dawn of emancipation, so that makes sense. Today, it's around one to 1.5%. So to say that our public policy efforts um, to eradicate, and I'm putting efforts in quotes, uh, to eradicate the racial wealth gap has been a total failure is an understatement. And mostly it is the myths that we tell about markets. These are the myths that I grew up sort of in academia, on Wall Street, in law school, um, in, in my you know, undergrad hearing about markets. Um, the myths uh, that, uh, uh, and, the, and these, these present the biggest obstacles, I think, today to, to achieving racial justice and closing the racial wealth gap. Uh, for example, the promise of free market capitalism is that it does not discriminate, that free markets offer equal opportunity for all to trade and prosper based on one's skill and ability. So even if you're an anti-market, you know, Marxist, or if you're pro-market Adam Smith, the idea is that money goes to the highest good or, or you know, property is, uh, you know, capital that you can grow, right? But it all comes down to policy and law, because if you have property and the law isn't protecting it, or if you have property um, and the law is depriving you of your earned rights, then, then capitalism uh, doesn't work. So alternatively, um, either markets do discriminate, which I don't think is the case. Um, uh, what I do think is the case is, is that it, the American economy has never borne any resemblance to a free market. Uh, for most of our history, uh, black men and women have been excluded from occupations, schools, neighborhoods, and trade, and their property was not protected by law, the basic premise of, of capitalism. Um, in each historical mo moment in America where wide middle class wealth is being created, so Homestead Act, FHA mortgage loans, GI bills, uh, you know, we can take it to the subprime crisis uh, where it was extraction, but also wealth creation, uh, Black communities were shut out of land and wealth accumulation. Sometimes it was purposeful, often. Um, more recently, it has been a byproduct of historic uh, legacies that were never remedied, and also some purposeful um, uh, blocks as well. Um, and the, the most pernicious thing, I think the thing that got me angriest uh, during this research is that, that at certain pivot points in history, specifically during Reconstruction and during the Civil Rights era, where the, the call to um, justice, where the Black communities and their allies were demanding state intervention and capital to remedy clear historic injustice, um, the rhetoric of free market capitalism has been used as a weapon to undercut these claims. And instead of real reform, the Black community has been offered a self-help market of segregated banks and businesses. And I think we're at that pivot point again, which is why I, I hope that we can take the lessons of this history to heart as we um, pr pr propose and, and respond to public policy efforts today. Um, in other words, leaders, you know, upholding a, a white dominated market institution promised and have continued to promise that the market would fix the problems that had been created by law and backed by private and, and law sanctioned violence. So quickly, I want to go through this history and, and to show that insofar as the levers of power and public po policy were held by you know, the, the institutions of, of, of uh, race-based sort of hierarchy, uh, that the markets would perpetually block uh, capital accumulation for Black communities. So starting with Reconstruction, uh, we, talk about, we, can, we talk about slavery, or when I've heard uh, people talk about slavery, it's usually about the labor extortion of slavery, right? So the cotton produced by slave labor. But an important part of, of enslavement was that um, um, the, the men and women held as slaves were capital on which more capital could be 
uh, built through leverage and through lending. And large markets were built on not just the capital in the, the uh, bodies, the human, the property in man, but also in the production of their labor. So it was a real dual uh, benefit here. And at the dawn of reconstructions, I won't go through the economics of slavery, but it's an important, important point to make the very currency of the South, and this is actually Southern currency, um, and the trade and the banking system was based on um, uh, uh, slavery. Um, and so during reconstruction, the freedmen were expected to transition from being capital themselves to becoming capitalists. And freedmen and their abolitionist allies demanded land as a form of reparations. And by the way, many demanded it as a punishment to the treasonous Confederates. Uh, without land, they reasoned, uh, freedom and justice would be meaningless and participation in capitalism would be a farce. Uh, yet President Andrew Johnson uh, vetoed the land grant with the four, 40 acres and a mule, which was part of the Freedmen's Bureau bill. And except for one provision, which, which I'll talk about, he reasoned that the freedmen would be protected by the free market and by contract law, that they would bargain for fair wages and buy their own land. Uh, so this was either unbelievably naive or incredibly cynical. Um, the Southern economy was nothing like a free market. Uh, white men refused to sell property to Blacks. State legislators, lawyers, judges drafted laws governing every aspect of Black labor. Um, and they restricted Black men and women from skilled trades. Uh, vagrancy laws were prevalent. Uh, wages were capped by law and by cabal between the employers, and violations led to convict labor, so another extractive force. So by the end of Reconstruction, most freedmen were left landless, voteless, and with practically every profession blocked to them, except for growing cotton. Of course, that was the entire point. The worldwide cotton market was heavily dependent on cheap and abundant cotton from the United States. And in order to have cotton exports at a fixed price, so if you look at commodity prices, we don't like fluctuations. So think of oil. If cotton was oil today, or any sort of commodity that we rely on for vast global markets, and all of a sudden you thought the oil of the price of oil was going to go up phenomenally, exponentially, you would want that to stop. Um, and what had happened uh, in Haiti was that when the, the uh, freedmen and women there gained emancipation through, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, beating out their, um, beating off their uh, oppressors, um, they sugar output halted. Um, they refused to grow sugar some, and some grew it, but as a cash crop, while they also took their plots of land and grew subsistence crops, which is uh, what any landowner does. You would grow half of your land to feed your family and the other half or a third, depending on the market, would be for a cash crop. What happens when that output halts? Prices skyrocket, which is good for the landowners who are growing cotton, really bad for the merchants in the North, really bad for the merchants in Liverpool. Um, so uh, there was every reason to believe that freed American slaves would go this route. And this was very well documented in the memos and telegrams sent across um, uh, trading lines. Um, so so uh, Black men and women were denied land, not because the government was constrained by laissez-faire, but because, as Andrew Johnson explained, America was and should remain a white man's government. During this time, uh, the federal government was actively providing free land to homesteaders and um, expansion of the railroads, uh, free land uh, uh, to the, the railroad and, and post. So it wasn't as though giving land away was anathema. It was though you couldn't give land to freedmen because you needed that cotton growth. Um, so instead of land, the freedmen and women got a, a bank. Um, in 1865, the Union General Oliver Otis Howard explained that the bank was better anyway uh, because it would teach about thrift and savings, that freedmen should earn land and not receive it as a gift. Uh, the Freedmen Savings Bank, if there are if you're picking up historical uh, uh, similarities, that is purposeful. A lot of this rhetoric, this, you know, you should earn it. It's about personal responsibility comes up after, uh, you know, enslavement at the dawn of emancipation, land being taken away and basically a re-enslavement post-reconstruction, people are uh, lecturing freedmen on how to save their money and to buy land. 
so that they could earn it and feel good about themselves. Okay, and they did, of course. Uh, the Freed's, Friedman Savings Bank was quite successful. It drew deposits from all sorts of, of uh, uh, freedmen from all over the South. No bank before or ever since the Freedman Bank resembled it. It was created by Congress, signed into law by Lincoln, uh, uh, by special charter, and the bank was immediately successful. Um, and one of the main reasons that the bank was trusted was that the money seemed to be backed by the full faith and credit of the treasury. Why? Uh, because the bills and notes in the building were covered with government insignia. The notes um, seemed to be showing uh, government backing. Why does that matter? At the time, uh, we didn't have FDIC insurance. The treasury wasn't issuing currency like it is today. Most bank notes were valued at, at based on the reputation of the bank. So if you got a note from JP Morgan that was $100, it would be worth $100 because it was JP Morgan's bank. If it was some podunk bank in Eastern Maryland or Western Maryland, wherever the rural part is, you would discount it because you didn't know if that bank was gonna be there when you went to go redeem your note. So the reason this government uh, insignia was important is because it allowed for those deposits to swell the bank's coffers. And they did, of course. Um, there's $1.5 billion of deposits that came in. The bank was never going to lend loans. It was not to be a commercial bank. It was so, supposed to be a glorified piggy bank to just hold the savings, which would have been valuable in and of itself. It wasn't capitalism. There was no lending, but it was still, it would have been okay if it had just kept the money. Of course, uh, you can imagine what happens. The white manager of the bank, Henry Cook, whose brother was the infamous Wall Street speculator, Jay Cook, took the deposits and basically looted the bank. Uh, it was railroad stock speculation, like the subprime market of the day. He speculated the money away and, and lost it. And the significance of this failure reverberated and lingered through the Black community. So those who lost their deposits, there was no FDIC insurance. There was no congressional, there was no backing from the full faith and credit of the federal government. Um, and Black leaders and bankers for almost a century repeated the assertion that the failure of the bank had caused the Black community to completely lose trust in the federal government and in the banking sector. So uh, W.E. Du Bois says in Black Reconstruction, not even 10 additional years of slavery could have done so much to throttle the thrift of the freedmen as the mismanagement and bankruptcy of the Freedmen's Bank chartered for the nation for their special aid. I began this project, like I said, as an, uh, looking through the FDIC. My first book was on unbanked and underbanked. And one of the data that stuck out to me was the vast racial disparities in unbanked and underbanked populations in, in uh, uh, racially. And in the black population, especially in the South, um, something like 60% of the black population was unbanked or underbanked. And the number one reason was a lack of trust in banks. And I've asked this from audiences uh, when I lecture across the country, whose grandmother, grandfather, father told them not to trust a bank with your savings, right? So this, this is something that black bankers talk about to this day, about this distrust in banking because of hard earned wages being taken away um, by the Freedmen's Bank. Um, so by the time the bank failed, uh, the disenfranchisement of the Black population was complete. Uh, the rights written into the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were nullified by legislators, uh, courts, the police power um, of, of the South, and the paramilitary violence of the Klan. And in the series of decisions uh, between 1873 and 1898, the Supreme Court weakened the rights of Black citizens and blessed Jim Crow disenfranchisement outlawing uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 as unconstitutional, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court wrote 20 years after the end of slavery. Um, he says that it was high time for the slaves to stand on their own two feet and stop being treated as I, and I quote, as the special favorite of the law. Okay, so you already are seeing signs of this um, reverse discrimination and why are we, you know, um, uh, doing special favors uh, for freedmen. Um, in fact, for the next century, and to this day, the 14th Amendment came up more to defend corporations against state overreach than it did to protect Black men and women from the hostile arm of the state. Um, and of course, we, we kind of can guess who the special favorite of the law actually is. Um, so after the Freedmen's Bank, there was a blossoming of uh, Black banks during the Jim Crow South, but it's a double-edged sword. These banks were um, a response to heavy 
Jim Crow and heavy Klan violence. You could not trust a white bank. You, a white bank would not take your deposits. And if they did, you weren't certain that you would not be um, mistreated and physically harmed uh, for, for collecting. And this, this was a prevalent story that, that many had. And so many of the black own banks in the South were a response to this. Um, similar, uh, Maggie Walker, St. Luke's Penny Banks, this is Women's History Month, I think, are we still in that? Um, she was the first woman of any race to start a bank, the first black banker to be inducted into the Virginia Bankers Association. Her bank is one of a handful of banks that survives the Great Depression. Her bank actually, not, her, not herself, but her bank survives the Great Depression and goes down with the financial crisis of 2008. Um, so uh, that, that decimated uh, a lot of these um, small community banks. But 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 her bank started uh, as a as a you know uh, from a church organization. She had a college savings fund. She had a newspaper. She had a school. She did everything. She provided for the community where there were needs. A burial society, um, insurance, and, and most of the banks that era. Not quite as successful as hers, but most of them were um, this way. Um, in 1910, you have the Great Migration North. It is met with heavy segregation, which leads to concentrated Black populations in northern cities. And you have banks, um, Jesse Binga's bank being one of the most successful. I thought that story in the book was one that you know will enrage you because he was a very he was a prominent Black banker in uh, Chicago, um, very a good banker. Um, he uh, was very, a very successful uh, a banker. And during the Great Depression, um, his bank failed, as uh, do other banks. And it, although it was a really terrible story because he had made safeguards against his bank's failure. Anyway, he's the only banker uh, uh, to be imprisoned um, for a bank failure during the Great Depression. It's, it's a really tragic story. Um, anyway, um, but even during this time when segregation was complete, um, Black banks were unable to grow wealth in Black communities. And this is one of the nuggets in, in the book, which I will um, skip over, but it, it was the thesis that I was going at when I first started the book. The idea that you can have banks taking deposits and making loans in a segregated economy and that that would create wealth in that community is, is a fiction, it's a farce. And I show uh, why that is um, through these balance sheets. Um, essentially it comes down to um, the, their assets were on loans to homes. And in that era and to this day, black homes in black communities because of segregation do not retain their home values. Um, it is a less dramatic today, but it still is a, a major pernicious reason for the racial wealth gap to exist. In other words, white homes in, in white communities, and, and whiteness, of course, is a broad label that is expansive and amorphous. It is just not black. Um, white communities, uh, white homes um, gain value for by nature of not being in black communities. And, and so that is where uh, racism and that history is embedded in value and in, in, in capital today. Um, so um, the, the New Deal, of course, is a massive restructuring of the banking system and really creates, this is the second pivot point of the creation of massive wealth um, for the middle class between 1933 and 1970, low inequality indexes, hundreds of thousands of small community banks, credit unions, thrifts are formed, they're safe, stable, profitable. This is the George Bailey myth. This is the myth I was I was trying to go at in, in, in the origins of the book because it's all being written on FHA loans. Uh, banks are thriving as our communities because um, the New Deal takes the risk out of banking. Uh, loans uh, deposits are insured by FDIC insurance. Loans are insured uh, and guaranteed by the FHA and the GI Bill and the Farm Loan Bill, and they're sold in a secondary market by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So the risk is, is low. I, I, in banking, we talk about 363 banking, 3% 3 on deposits by law, 6% on loans by law, you're on the golf course by 3 p.m. You're just printing money, okay? Um, this built the middle class, it created intergenerational wealth. It is the sort of MAGA, you know, make America great again that people pine for. The New Deal also built the lily white suburb um, of homeowners and a segregated uh, black uh, uh, neighborhoods um, through redlining. And um, the HOLC appraisers went around the country using census data and elaborate questionnaires to predict the likelihood of risk. This was initial FICO scores um, and risk profiling. You can't determine which 
you know, who is uh, worthy of a loan. It wasn't as though they gave loans to credit worthy borrowers. They took two tenant workers, you know, two industrial workers in Manhattan, both of whom were paying $50 in rent. One got to get a $35 mortgage for a home in Levittown with the parks and the bowling alley and the schools, and one got to pay $50 in, in rent. And the way that they determined who got those loans was the neighborhoods that they could live in and they were uh, their race, okay? So race was a number one um, indicator uh, that they used for perceived risk. Um, this is one example, this is Atlanta. This is, you can go, there's this website called Mapping Inequality by Richmond University and they have uh, uploaded all of these maps, um, the actual redlining maps and the uh, write-outs for every neighborhood. And you can see the way that they describe the racial elements of each neighborhood. So some, some, sometimes it says subversive races. You know, sometimes it'll say, oh, there's, you know, Mexicans and, you know, other subversive undesirable races. Sometimes it'll just say black or whatever, but, but really that's a number one um, predictor. So this neighborhood is in Atlanta. It is where Spellman and Morehouse and Atlanta University, uh, uh, which it was at the time, um, the best neighborhood in Georgia, probably one of the best neighborhoods in the country, best being judged by the way that you judge uh, neighborhood quality. So single family homes, uh, businesses, parks, all the desirable elements of a neighborhood. And if you look at inhabitants, it says, you know, foreign born 0%, uh, you know, black, uh, Negro, yes, 100% infiltration of. So that was a big predictor. How close are, how how likely is this neighborhood to be inter, in, infiltrated by um, undesirable races or racially inharmonious? Um, so so this led, of course, to you know uh, two different uh, credit markets. One in the white suburb where you're uh, building that wealth, you're getting that home equity. And by the way, the FHA had a consumer lending arm, which I talk about in the book, I won't go into here, but with those homes, there was also a revolving credit um, scenario where you got a credit card, you got to go to Montgomery Ward and Sears and, you know, furnish your home, buy your car, all of that stuff with a interest rate cap credit card. Um, in the Black neighborhoods where there wasn't home equity, there was also no uh, revolving credit, there was installment credit. And installment credit is night and day from revolving credit. Installment credit is where the lender where you go, it's like rent a center where you go to buy a couch, uh, you pay 10 times as much and the and the uh, interest rates are high and they're bundled together. So if you buy a bunch of furniture, you miss one payment, the last payment, you lose all of it. It's not uh, separatable. So, so that's important um, historically because that is where the seeds of the civil rights era were planted in the movements by in Harlem, in Detroit, in um, uh, Richmond. Uh, and in Baltimore and in um, uh, Chicago, um, real sort of community activism at state legislatures on that interest rates on those contracts, the the the, con the lending contracts, and on interest rates, um, which I'll get to in just a second. But I, um, you know, I, I do want to uh, uh, say that you know some of the forces of segregation, the force that was motivated by racism, and it started out first with bombings. You know, Jesse Binga's house, I talked about the banker, his house was bombed 10 times and he kept moving back into a white neighborhood. Then, you know, signs, there'd be, you know, clan violence, but then it got sophisticated. It was racial covenant. So, um, you know, the FHA um, uh, um, uh, told, you know, realtors and, uh, you know, uh, uh, lenders to make sure that racial covenants were all in their homes. And this was the, the original creation of the HOA as well was to enforce racial covenants. Um, if you look up at any deed in any place in the country um, that was, you know, before 1970, when they stopped becoming enforceable, you'll see a racial covenant. There's, you know, um, someone, uh, respectable white people, it'll say Caucasian race. Um, and many of the parameters of whiteness um, so what is Caucasian? What counts and what doesn't? Uh, were these racial covenants being taken to court? So someone like me who, you know, uh, in some courts would determine, uh, you know, a Mongol and some some courts would determine to be, you know, an Arab, you know, what, and, and, and these are the old, old rules, but people would take cases like, well, I'm, you know, I am, I am Caucasian because look, you know, uh, the Middle East is right by the Caucasus Mountains and they're like, yeah, but you're a Mongol and, and you know, you're not, so you would take in the skull measurements and you'd be proving like, hey, I can move into this neighborhood. 
um, because I'm, I'm technically, you know, so, so this is where the parameters of whiteness was able to expand. One interesting parameter, and this is where public policy matters, and it doesn't, is that the Irish and the Italians were not white before the FHA. Explicitly, you know, racial maps, lower races, technically, quote unquote, scientifically, um, were very much discriminated against. And once they got that FHA loan, we talk about that as a historical anomaly. So we didn't have to change hearts and minds. We didn't have to change behaviors, right? The Irish, you know, were thought to be, you know, just violent inherently and racially and all that BS about that race, right? The inherent racial traits goes away once they're your neighbor in Levittown. So, you know, this is my push for change policy first, close the racial wealth gap, worry about changing hearts and minds later. Um, okay, on to the civil rights movement. I will, I think I'm, you know, I will stop at some point by, um, uh, because there's a lot more, but um, the, the two strands of the civil rights movement that, that usually get contrasted together, the black nationalists sort of Marcus Garvey to uh, Malcolm X, really start going at these institutions as being, you know, why are these white banks, these white lenders in our communities exploiting us? And that exploitation was very much about those installment contracts and the way that all of the stores that were coming into the ghetto were white and they were overcharging and people knew they were being screwed. They weren't, you know, dumb, right? They weren't taking it down and uh, taking it just lying, lying down, right? Adam Clayton Powell's movement, Marcus Garvey, all of that was just a response to this, this perceived exploitation. And some of it likened it to uh, the anti-colonial fight. So this was the, the nationalist streak, but it wasn't that far away um, from the Martin Luther King uh, who saw it differently, but also focused on this. So he took uh, Martin Luther King before, you know, the I Have a Dream speech, has a, a case that he takes to the black community in, in the 50s talking about, you know, our top, our five agenda items for the, our movement is black economic coherence and, and a boycott, right? So that Montgomery bus boycott, right? There was a Harlem boycott of a store on installment loans that started. And the store went to a court and said, this is unconstitutional. You can't boycott us for, you know, being racist, right? And the court says, well, sure you can, right? They can use their economic power. They can do this boycott. And so this informs then the Montgomery bus boycott was an economic boycott. We will stop using the buses to put that pressure on to get public policy changes, right? Which, what are the changes? Well, stop Jim Crow, stop segregation, all of this stuff. But the long game was economic redress. And so Martin Luther King, from the beginning to the end, it was never, the message was never forget racism, color blindness. It was not the, the, the whitewashed history. It was, we have come, we, you know, to, uh, um, we had a promissory note. This note was defaulted. Um, the, you know, we've been given a bad check. It's been marked insufficient funds. Martin Luther King talks about segregation. It's not to keep us apart. It is exploitation. It is, it, it is economic. Um, and, and Martin Luther King, of course, you know, by 1968 is no longer being listened to when he's assassinated, but really between 1965 and 1968, the whole mood had already shifted. And I go through this again, but it's, but if you look at back at reconstruction, where you're all of a sudden having this backlash of like, well, why are you getting special rights? That, that same thing happened after that, the, the, the high sort of, you know, uh, flying rhetoric of the civil rights law, the voting rights law. All, Selma, all of that stuff was before 1965. By 1968, the, the mood was um, complete white backlash. Uh, Roger Wilkins of the NAACP says, you couldn't pass the Emancipation Proclamation in Congress in 1966. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I follow this um, because I think we, we need to tell the story right. By 1967, Black uh, poverty, uh, half of black children were growing up in deep poverty. Uh, black men and women had, you know, a one fifth of the total wealth um, as, as, as poor white families, okay? And, Mar and Martin Luther King, right? He took his family to the segregated black um, uh, ghetto in sh Chicago. And he says they were all, you know, grumpy and depressed, you know, by the end of the month. And, and he's, I never saw racism like I saw in Chicago. Um, you know, I talk about the Kerner Commission that, that really drills down on this. But the important 
points too, I think, are that people like George Romney, the other sort of side of the Republican Party, George Romney calls the white suburbs a noose around the black ghetto. George Romney is the a very active um, mover in in you know a force for integration. Um, but of course, what happens is uh, you know the 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 riots, which I, I go into. Um, uh, Nixon uh, comes uh, in power and he's got the two sort of, you know, it's all sort of anti-Black subliminal messages. This is according to his aide, John L. Rickman, uh, didn't make that up. Um, he, uh, it was very much a, a strategy of law and order. And the other side of the strategy, which gets less talked about is Black capitalism. And the reason it gets less talked about is because we're still living it. Um, black capitalism was a Nixon um, uh, sort of his detente on race to take to, to take the sting out of the, the real justice demands of both the black radicals and, and Martin Luther King's movement, and also to uh, pretend like he was doing something because that was the, the, the plank he was fighting. So black capitalism was basically, as his opponent, Hubert Humphrey says, it was capitalism without capital. And uh, essentially, uh, you know, affirmative action, treasury deposits, opportunity zones, we're no longer calling them the ghetto. We're calling it enterprise zones. We're calling it, you know, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, places where entrepreneurs can go get a win-win. Um, I will fly through this because I, I want to leave room for questions. Reagan really hones that. His entire civil rights plank in his platform is tax cuts, because tax cuts is the cure to racism. The market will cure it. Okay, um, Clinton. I thought if you thought I was just going to be against the Republicans, just keep, keep waiting. Clinton really hones in on this. His HUD official is Andrew Cuomo, who talks about um, these zones as being, you know, we can get niche uh, uh, banks to go in and get win-win profits. And um, uh, Larry Summers, um, you know, um, talks about how, you know, that we don't need to do anything for um, these these uh, uh, black segregated neighborhoods, we just need uh, incentives and the entrepreneurs will make money and the, the that will fix um, uh, the problem of race. And of course, they did find money. It was in subprime credit. Uh, it wasn't uh, Black entrepreneurs. It was um, uh, Wall Street and the Black community lost 53% of their wealth. Um, you know, uh, during this time, you know, the CDFI was created, the CRA uh, leading now to, you know, a, a, I, I went light on Barack Obama. I was re, I was writing this. He didn't, to his credit, didn't um, up the scale on black capitalism. He just kind of didn't do much. Um, and it was aftermath of the financial crisis. So, um, you know, and again, I uh, will leave it at that. And then Donald Trump's opportunity zones. Um, I am very hopeful that we are in a different place right now. Um, everything that our uh, president right now has said seems to be um, indicating a change of pace. I probably can't say more because I have been trying to be influential in in what happens. But um, I I, uh, I I think that that um, it is time to sort of shed these destructive myths that capitalism and tax credits and CDFIs will fix uh, what public policy robust public policy created. Uh, we cannot deflect the responsibility of economic equality onto Black communities alone. They did not cause it. Um, uh, it is not their problem to fix. Um, uh, so I will end with a W.E. Du Bois quote, and I will take this picture off because um, we are done with that. And the quote, quote is uh, 1948, W.E. Du Bois says, the, gr the great problem of American democracy was that it had not yet been tried. Um, so. I will uh, stop and leave some room for questions. Wow! Uh, thank you. Um, I, I I told I said you were an action academic. Uh, that sounded like an action academic in action. Um, thank you. Um, your passion comes across. Uh, the analysis and the data is is what I recognize in academia, but the passion is the extra special. Uh, ingredient in this recipe. Um, Rashern Baker, could I ask you to, to ask our guest the first question? I think you probably have more than one, but uh, you, you get pride of place here, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I do. And I, I'll start with, with this one. This, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, it was absolutely uh, amazing. 
And I'm, I'm looking at the text that I'm getting from uh, various folks here who are listening. And uh, we've all agreed that you should rewrite the history book for, uh, for the United States. Uh, but that's not my question. So, <laughs> and I'm really fascinated by this. And that is, can you tell us a bit more about your personal background <laughs> and, and how you came to focus on um, you know, Black banks? I, I have yes. to say, I was surprised when I you know, mm -hmm. saw the book and I saw you and I was like, wow, I never thought about this. How did you come to this yeah. book uh, and, and to write about Black banks and, and racial wealth gap? I mean, like I said, that was not my intent. I did not start uh, wanting to write about Black banks. I did not think that I um, uh, was the one to do it. I s wanted to write about, um, you know, I, I, I wrote about banks because I was on Wall Street and I saw all these myths during the financial crisis. I started in Wall Street well before the financial crisis and I was being told a certain way that the banking system worked. And then it wasn't that way. You know, the Fed came in with all of this money and I all of a sudden kind of saw the curtain go down. And so I went into academia as a banking person and, you know, really tried, you know, with all of my articles up until uh, this book to, to kind of um, reframe the way we think about banking in a way that is um, adequate to understanding, you know, some of the flaws in that system. I've always wanted, I've always focused on, you know, the low income people. I've, you know, I grew up, you know, poor. And so that that's where the personal, um, you know, uh, connection is. And I started this project again, wanting to look at these banks outside the system and how, how to show, how to prove my larger point. And um, then I, you know, I kept saying like, will someone send me the book? I kept asking the librarians and all my research, can, can I just get the book on black banks? And, and surely someone has written this history. And, and, and this was a 10 year project. I actually wrote a whole nother book while this one was on the back burner. I've written a bunch of articles because I wanted, I was waiting for someone else. And finally I talked to, you know, several of, of my mentors who said like, no, you know, you, you should write this because it needs to be a banking scholar that does it. Um, it's not, you're not telling a history, you're telling a, a banking story um, that hopefully is widely applicable. And then once I started writing, it became, different. I just let their research take me. Um, and, and it really, um, you know, when I was in these archives and, and reading this Nixon stuff, I was like, surely someone has written a book about black capitalism. Yeah, I just, I was surprised that I had to do this archival work. And I, I do hope and I have seen a lot of other scholars dig into this. Um, and But I didn't do it without a lot of fear and trepidation. I went into this very um, cautiously, because I, um, always assumed I had to read a hundred books for every chapter because I always assumed that there's surely someone else out there who has written this. And I think I just came to maybe nobody else cared about look, getting into the balance sheets. And, and because I did care that I, I could do it. And if nobody read it, you know, the, the, the thing in the back of my mind writing this book is like, it's okay, nobody will read it just write it and it's fine. I already had tenure. I was already a full professor. I was just like, just write the book that you need to write. Nobody will read it. And I've just been amazed that people have found it because it was an academic press book. I, you know, I, uh, it, it was not a marketed as a bestseller and it's, it's not a bestseller, but it, it, I'm surprised at, at the people who picked it up um, and have read it. So I'm incredibly humbled. We have uh, a number of county executives with us tonight on the line. We have uh, other academics, action academics. We have many students. Uh, I would invite you all, if you want to ask uh, Professor Baradaran a question, uh, you can raise your virtual hand or you can put it in the uh, chat. Um, we can do either way. Um, I do see that Yvette Downs has uh, a question in the chat. Yvette, if you want to unmute yourself, you could ask it yourself or I could read it. And then we'll take up uh, folks as they uh, raise their hands or put things in. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate this and I appreciate this conversation. I have to say, I haven't finished your book yet, but um, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to asking to get to the end of the book to find out your recommendations. But I do want to preface it by saying I graduated from um, a predominantly white institution, but I did my, Spel my junior year um, at a historically black college, Spelman. 
And that is where I had in my banking class, I, they actually talked about black banks. And I know I would not have gotten that at Vassar. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was not, I've never got any of that in any of my economic, I'm an economic mm -hmm. major, did not get that kind of background. Okay. So I'm really, it's, I'm not surprised you didn't find a lot on it, mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I am currently working in, in trying to look at uh, this whole world of black banking and how, what we and the government can do to support financial minority deposit institutions. And I guess I just want to know, how do you see um, black banks playing into wealth creation, particularly when uh, they're trying to survive. We're trying to, mm -hmm. we, we have a government yeah. policy that says we should be promoting them and, and, and helping them um, to be stronger. Um, how do we help them be stronger and how do they play into this wealth creation? Yeah, no, that's a, an excellent question. And I think, you know, toward the end, you won't find a ton of satisfying answers, but really I think it's, look, it's not the job of black banks to fix the racial wealth gap. That is, a, that is a problem that was created by the federal government. It was a problem that the banking system itself and the credit policies created. So, so I think what, what does need to happen is the MDIs, Black banks specifically, need to be at the head of the table when this discussion happens. But the money and the, the motive has got to come from the places where money comes from, which is the federal government policy, the Fed, the Fed itself. I mean, look at the trillions created practically overnight to deal with the COVID crisis. When we want to fix problems, the resources are there. And it ends up being actually quite beneficial. The FHA was a win-win. I mean, the FHA fund kept its you know, deposits and the people who got those mortgage loans got the wealth. Um, so so we, look at, we look toward Black banks and I think part of looking toward Black banks is a, it's this decoy, like, well, what can they do to fix the racial wealth gap? Which is like, they didn't create it. They're doing the best they can. As you said, they are barely surviving. Um, the financial crisis took it down from 50 to 20. Um, and even those 20, if you add up all of their capital, it's a bad weekend for JP Morgan. In fact, it's a, it's a fine for the racial discrimination that Bank of America did, how much wealth Bank of America extracted from the black community for, during just the subprime crisis, the fees that they paid is more than the entire totality of the capital of black banks. So, so uh, you know, I think head of the table, absolutely keep, maintain, promote, but it is not their job to fix the racial wealth gap. It's not their job, but what can we do to help to, how can they participate? If the government is supporting them, how can they actually be, what, what do we need to give to them to help them help capital. the communities that they serve? I mean, capital. Hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, I, I do have a couple chapters on other proposals that have been made. Um, I have uh, uh, talked, I've written up, you know, a proposal of mine called the Homestead Act, which is a grant, a government grant um, run, runs like it's funded by the Import Export Bank. I mean, I have lots of details in there if you want to look. Uh, basically, a land grant taking up uh, properties uh, from, you know, communities, formerly red line communities, handing over those properties redeveloped to the, the residents of those communities, you know, um, the black and brown residents, and with the development funds baked in. So it's like a redo of the FHA, the deposits there, you're paying as much as you did in rent, you get the equity, and, and you do it holistically. So it's not like you're putting the onus on one individual out there, you know, it is you're reviving a community whole scale. Um, and with with government capital, that will come back, but you need a 10 year, 20 year investment, and then everyone gets that equity the schools are funded by those taxes there's there's, a, there's if we want to do it we know how to do it we've done it before um it's just do we do we want to and we haven't thank you Chanel powell you've got a great question in the chat but i want to invite you if you would like to pose that question uh yourself or if not i'd be happy to read it but uh chanel would you like to pose a question Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for the invitation, Professor uh, Baker. Um, you know, thank you so much for the, the space and time to have this conversation. And as I just glanced over at my phone, um, I saw an article come through and it said, a tax code optimized for white wealth leaves Black Americans behind. 
And I think it's so timely. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll revisit the question that I actually put in the chat. Um, from a recommendation from one of my really good friends, Loic, who's also on the call, um, he shared with me that I should read the book by Eddie S. Glaude, uh, which is called Begin Again. And it mm -hmm. talks about the stark reality that we find ourselves in today's society. And he essentially said, until we confront our original sin, which is deeply rooted in racism and capitalism, it's going to be very difficult for us to move the needle in any stretch of the imagination. Um, so from the experts on the call um, and from your time in industry, one of the things that I have been disheartened with is that many Americans, we saw through the election that they chose <laughs> the same thing that they have been choosing for many, many years. And as somebody who's young and bright eyed and witchy tell who's just starting their career and working in a, a very large company, one of the things I just wanna know from people who spent time on the earth longer than I, you know, what is a viable path forward? We hear investments, we hear, you know, just reallocating, you know, wealth and X, Y, and Z, but what is a viable path forward? Um, I, I really need a task force in place and I'm willing to, you know, throw, <laughs> throw my hat in the ring, but I'm tired of, of talking. I'm, I'm more about the action piece. So we'd love to hear from, from, from anyone on the call. I mean, uh, I, I endorse the, the, the book that, that, um, uh, I read anything, everything and anything that Eddie Loud writes, um, especially Begin Again, because it, it's rooted in, in James Baldwin. And um, it's a, a rereading of Baldwin. And I think, you know, Baldwin is someone I, uh, my editor at one point said, no more Baldwin quotes, you have to pick 10. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I, I read Fire next time I teach it. And uh, it mm -hmm. is probably the most cogent, uh, thing ever written about America, period. Um, I think W. Du Bois and James Baldwin uh, are, you know, the, the the two people that you can just read American history <laughs> yeah. by them. Um, and uh, so, yes, action, uh, you know, uh, and talk, I think, the thing that we um, get stuck on, though, are myths and narratives. And so I think, um, once we can retell those narratives, I think action happens, policy shifts. I mean, look at the way that the New Deal dealt with the Great Depression versus how we talk about black poverty, right? Um, and so I, I, I think it's important to, to get people on the same page about what is the story, what caused this um, problem, and then you can fix it. Because I think what we have right now, I. What, what I hear, what motivated me to write is, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, we need more entrepreneurship. We need more mm -hmm. personal responsibility and choices. And, you know, um, well, people just you know, pick themselves up by the bootstraps and do, you know, um, and, and maybe that your generation doesn't um, think that, but it still comes up a lot. So. Mm. Tony. Okay. Oh, sorry, Chanel. Tony, I see your hand up. Yes, please. Um, first of all, Professor Bardaran, I just wanted to say thank you for your depiction of the attack of all fronts from a financial standpoint on the black, on black banks and the black community. But um, a question that I had was, how do you suggest that as a community, more than just African-American community, how do we attack the forms of uh, structural racism that have affected black banks historically and to this date, how do you how do you suggest that we go against that? And what are the first steps that you would recommend that we would that we should take? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that's a good question. I mean, policy, I think um, getting to the root of it is recognizing how we got here and um, not blaming uh, you know, anything on the, the communities that were victimized by systemic racism, right? And to really uh, absorb what the Kerner Commission was trying to tell us, what the, you know, Friedman's bill before it got, you know, uh, 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 gutted tried to tell us, what W. Du Bois has been trying to tell us, like this, this, these are structural problems. These are, racism is baked into the very fabric of our economic system and to root it out you you just you you have to shift that that mindset of of blame and of, of zero sumness and to really um deal with it 
like we would deal with a recession or poverty? How do we deal with, you know, um, uh, opiate crisis versus crack epidemic, right? How, I mean, maybe we're not quite there to deal with the opiate crisis yet, but there are some things that we realize are, you know, like the COVID crisis, right? This was an outside thing. We need public policy to fix it. We failed phenomenally and we're all suffering, right? Our, this is our year anniversary because of absolute public policy failures, but this was an external thing. It was a virus, it's a threat. Um, and uh, this is this is part this is part of it. Is is black communities are um, uh, not responsible for fixing the thing that was created because of a certain economic system that was based on racial exploitation. And we and we get rid of the economic systems. We just eradicate slavery. And Brian Stevenson talks about this very cogently. And he was my law professor, so I'm going to flex here. Um, but Brian Stevenson talks about how you know when you we got rid of slavery. But we had built all these racial myths to justify the system for economics. Same thing after Reconstruction, same thing after civil rights. It's like, well, okay, so we're going to stop slavery, but we, we justified it as like, well, you know, higher races, lower races. First, we used religion, right? Well, God deemed it. And then, you know, uh, we used social Darwinism, right? Darwin itself, well, this is the, the way that human biology works. And then we use a law of the market. We said, well, supply and demand. And it's, you know, people just, they're getting paid for what the market market is worth. And and so we we never tackled those myths. Once that that the, the exploitative economic system ended, once segregation ended, once Jim Crow ended, we never were like, hey, we we told these stories about racism. We told these stories about, you know, black you know the black race being lower than the white race can we just talk about why that that we did that and and you know it is very human to just ignore the past but it's very american to to just assume that progress will just inevitably come that everything will get better and and other you know like the germans you know when they when they, when the nazis got expelled from that system painfully horrifically after the horrific acts that they did, the Nuremberg trials was very much like they they got down into that Nazi ideology and they said no more. Like we we we're gonna just put the late daylight into it. We're gonna you know get, get the Nazis right as many as we can and like they they are not welcome in polite society. And what we did with the the treasonous Confederates and the slaveholders is just say you know what we're good. Here's your land back. Let's just not talk about it. Okay. Um, and South Africa, you know, post-apartheid, they said, like, look, we had this whole system. And I'm not saying those problems are done, but they brought it out and they said this was, this was, these were the theories that we justified apartheid on, and no more. And we we just we, we've never had truth and reconciliation, um, I think, here for slavery. We just want to say, like, let's just let's just forget it happened, let's just be colorblind and look at people's souls. Well, that's not gonna work. Right, it's it's not going to work because those theories are still there. I mean, you see racial eugenics coming back. You're starting to see this IQ BS coming back. We just never purged it. We never said, "Hey, we we had all the pseudoscience that was bunk." Right, it's coming back. It'll come back, I and mean, we've got Nazis coming back. Right, I mean, not fully, right, but it. Um, anyway. That's that's a longer soapbox, than, <laughs> but 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 truth and reconciliation. Just like bring it out, like take out the sins, you know, and, and just you know uh, deal with it. I see a question from Professor David Falk in the chat. Uh, can their Community Reinvestment Act help with strengthening Black banks or majority minority communities? Um, it can be strengthened. Uh, I talk about the CRA in chapter seven of my book. Um, I think it is uh, not enough, um, but yes, it can help. Yeah. I can't talk too much about it for uh, a variety of public policy reasons. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. <Yeah. laughs> Action academic emphasis. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Veronica, I see you uh, put a thoughtful comment in the chat. Would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Well, 
Well, I, I will simply read the comment that Veronica put in the chat. I'm saddened that we don't have uh, better answers for our youth. I, I think one of the uh, things I'm taking away from tonight is that Professor Baradaran does have some answers and I'm, I'm hopeful that our youth on the call tonight are taking this as a challenge that uh, yeah. This is, this is the way you attack a policy problem, is going mm -hmm. head on at it. Mm -hmm. um, I see Stuart Pittman, another of our distinguished county executives here. Uh, Stuart, could I bait you into the conversation? Do you have a question? Sure, yeah, I do, I do. And um, yeah, I'm one of, I'm one of uh, County Executive Baker's mentees, um, part of his, his course in how to be a county executive he roped a bunch of us newcomers in, and and uh, so thank you for doing this, uh, Rishern. Um, and I was I was um, I'm really interested in the, the your comments on Community Reinvestment Act, even though you can't say much because I I was an old community organizer with Acorn back in the day and marched on the banks and sat across from the table and negotiated agreements with them in faraway places like Des Moines, Iowa, and and uh, even then tried to take it to the insurance industry and get them to stop redlining. That didn't go as far, but. But um, I'm always looking for a moment, uh, an opportunity, the historical moment uh, to, to move an agenda, a progressive agenda politically. And, and um, so my question is, do you think, I, I was thrilled today. I was really, 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 really happy today about the, uh, the American Recovery Act, the $1.9 trillion and how much of it is gonna go into the foundation of our economy and really mm -hmm. potentially create wealth for families, for low-income mm -hmm. families. Um, but uh, I feel like, and I could be wrong, I'm in a purple county, I got elected here, and, and I deal with a, a purple electorate that's a lot like America. And I feel like COVID has changed the, is a political opportunity, is an opportunity. It's changed Absolutely. the way people feel a little bit about poverty. Um, mm -hmm. The people who've been hit hardest by COVID, people are kind of okay with, with actually doing something to help people for a change. So do you feel like like that's made it a lot of absolutely. things possible. Yeah. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. You just see in the beginning some slight kind of that old school, like, well, you know, it's underlying conditions and maybe people should just be more careful, you know, like it, 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 it felt a little bit like there was that personal, like the last gas of that personal responsibility thing, but immediately became apparent, like, you know, COVID is, if I had another chapter in the book post COVID, it would be, look at how, systemic racism works. You have a virus that affects all bodies equally. And who is getting hit hardest, right? In my book, I keep going back to this quote that I saw from the 1910s, you know, when Wall Street gets a cold, Harlem gets the flu or Harlem gets pneumonia. There are several variations. And this is what happened. And it was, you know, we hire essential workers. Look at the hospital resources, right? There was this story in New York City of people dying of COVID because they just weren't enough hospital beds and people to like attend to um, COVID patients in certain hospitals versus others. Guess where those hospitals were, right? Guess who had uh, the ability to stay inside their house? Like me, I've been home, you know, I've been able to keep my job and pay my rent and get my groceries without ever having to, you know, be exposed um, to COVID. Um, and, and so I think quickly people saw, look, we, we you have this thing that is colorblind and it's affecting black and brown communities at such a vastly different rate. And so what is that? Well, you know, it, it, hopefully we can apply that to other things. And in the way that the responses have been, you know, I, I am also heartened by this last act. I'm heartened by the CARES Act. And the idea that we're kind of beating down like this idea of inflation. Oh, well, if you overheat the economy, we'll inflate like that. You know, I don't, there's a whole uh, ha a conversation happening in, in, uh, in the economist space of, of, of just killing that last myth of the Reagan era or, you know, the trickle down economics. Um, and, and one of the things I think about this that, you know, to, to, that really highlights that point is that, you know, the Wall Street actually didn't get a cold. Harlem got the flu, but Wall Street has been amazing. The capital has been increasing, the private equity. I mean, look at how much wealth has, I mean, the markets are soaring. And um, so, so I think people are kind of getting that there's these two different markets going on. There's these two different economies and one was ravaged by COVID and some people were able to protect themselves. And this is kind of how these systems work. And, and you're right, I mean, the child tax, not tax credit, the child provision in the last rescue package, which passed, I thought was 
the first time we're recognizing that maybe there's a floor for which we don't want children to fall under, right? Maybe what do kids deserve, right? Food, housing, and how are we going to do that, right? Maybe we just pay people money for kids, right? And 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 so I think this has um, absolutely been a pivot. I, I really hope that, and and I think Trump, um, for all of the pain and suffering that that caused, I think it um, killed for some the myth of colorblindness. Like we 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 you know, uh, uh, there, was, there was a huge backlash to our black president. It was a white lash very clearly. And, um, and, and, and obviously I think that the, the sort of masks came off and, and I think for some people who were not comfortable with that, I think that um, really motivated people. The Black Lives Matter movement, the George Floyd responses. I think a lot of this stuff is, is culminating. And I do think we're at that third pivot point. I mean, if reconstruction, civil rights era. And so there are all the risks inherent in the decoys that happened last time. So I just, I hope that we can kind of heed those last pivot points. I think- Sorry, I'm, I'm yeah. very <laughs> that uh, you, your background is in finance and law but you felt compelled to kind of go into historian mode and mm -hmm. dig into those archives because really no mm -hmm. one had done it. Um, one of the values of that work, I think, is that uh, I did not know the history of the Freedmen's Bank. And I think the collective um, shock to the black community um, uh, of that bank uh, corruption and failure um, is in some ways seems a bit parallel to the lack of, of trust in the system when it comes to things like giving and getting vaccines. Mm -hmm. There is a long historical memory mm -hmm. when something that horrible and that, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, twisted uh, mm -hmm. is inflicted on the community. Can you say a little bit more about um, kind of the, the remedies when trust is, uh, mm -hmm. a lack of trust has been unfortunately well-earned, um, mm -hmm. how do you begin to uh, enable a community to re-engage uh, the system that unfortunately hasn't earned their trust? Yeah, you have to earn their trust. I think that's it. I mean, you, 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 I think people are smart about uh, trust um, and, uh, I think, you know, uh, you know, and the data on the vaccines is mixed. I think some, some, I, I'm, I'm not an expert. I think some people are saying, no, it's not, a, it's not a distrust, it's just access, right? If you give people access and the information, they will take it. Um, and there is maybe less of a, a access, less, less information given because there are just less resources available in some of these communities. I think, um, so I, I don't know what the data is, but on the banking side, the trust, the distrust is very much there, but it's also access. It is, you know, my first book really dug down into this. Would you rather go to a check casher who t takes $10 off your check and gives you that cash or go to a bank who randomly issues a $35 overdraft fee and piles it on? So sometimes, It'll be $150 if you've overdrafted once. And so you can do that rational trade off. Like, I fundamentally believe that everyone does a cost benefit for their own selves. I think people are smart with money, especially low income people are much smarter with money. And the data reveals this as well. Um, you, you ask, you know, there's this great study ask people when they leave the grocery store, how much money did you spend just now on your total bill? And someone who's low income knows exactly how much everything costs and how much they spent. They can give you exactly where every dollar is going. And someone who's wealthy doesn't have to, and so doesn't, can't. And so this idea of financial literacy, or you just need to give people information, well, poor people know exactly where every cent goes. And I'm like, well, why did you go to this payday loan? It's like, well, my rent was due, so I could either get evicted, or you know, I know the costs here to this loan. I know it's not great, but what are my options? Um, so I think treating people as though they are making the best decision given their options is the best way toward public policy, because I think any other way is, an, is a cop out. I think this distrust is real, but I also think it is earned. It is, why would I go to a bank 
that um, not only do I feel like crap when I go in there, right? Um, it, a lot of banks have a history of purposeful, you know, um, exclusion, the hours, the three days it, te it takes to clear checks. Uh, so it's distrust, but it's also access and uh, giving people the right products and the right price. Um, go, gets you a long way toward restoring trust. Um, so my first book, I kind of ended with more of a easy solution. I talked about postal banking and that history, and I think that that there is a place where you know you 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 know. And I lived in Harlem for a decade, and I just observed the way that you know Chase Manhattan their lobby versus the post office lobby, and you really saw the way that certain community spaces worked. As, as a welcoming place and a place that was trusted, even, even though it's inconvenient, right? I mean, the post office is not anyone's emblem of, of convenience, but it's, it's, it's a trusted institution. And Chase wasn't, um, right, rightfully, as during the subprime crisis at the time. And so, you know, anyway, um, that's a tangent. You can read the first book on that. Great, Tony. Um, so, I'm sorry, I have another question. Mm -hmm. In terms of black banking and having higher frequency of them, how would you recommend that a black like members of the black community create these black banks and b how do they pertain their standing and you know get to a level of like a JP Morgan or a Goldman Sachs you know because it's like you said is this a difference between being like a JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs versus like a, some local bank in the area? So how do we get how do how do you get to that same level of prestige is my question. Yeah, I, I think the goal is for JP Morgan to have less market share. I think um, you uh, we we've had laws in place, you know, that were eradicated over the last 20 years where every community had similar sized banks. We capped bank size for a reason. So you have competition. So you can have black banks that were just as big and we allowed five big banks to dominate a market. You have 80% of the assets being held now by five institutions. And, uh, you know, they can diversify, um, but that's that's not good for anybody. It's certainly not good for um, the communities that are outside of that system. I think you see it in tech, you see, you know, Amazon. So how do you, you know, do we want, uh, uh, you know, a diverse board of Amazon, or do we just want Amazon to have less market power and so other people can compete in these markets? And we have rules for that, right? We have anti-monopoly rules. We have bank bank rules that aren't being enforced in the way that they should to give to communities that power to provide for themselves. Um, so on top of just fixing that historic segregation, I think we have to fix that market power scenario. Um, you have too much market power concentrated in too few hands, and that leads to bad policy, and it leads to exploitation. And I think more democracy is always good, more competition is good, um, and uh, allowing communities to not have to compete against it. You're never going to win against J.P. Morgan if it's if they have as much market power. It, it, they would rather have you know all the they will put the Black Lives Matter sign up. They will diversify their board and uh, to retain their market share. So that's, that's I think, something to watch. Well, I'd like to give Rashern Baker our, our last question, chance to take us out. But I do see uh, one question just before that, Rashern, from Linda Guarine in the chat asks, have you heard of businesses being created as a result of reading your book uh, to help solve, solve the problem? Um, no, the only the only thing I've heard create uh, Netflix, someone at Netflix read my book and convinced the Netflix board, the company to give $100 million um, to uh, black credit unions. And, and so that that was a, a really proud day. It's just an employee that took it up and I helped them figure out, um, you know, which I, we chose a credit union and they just, and they said that that was the first of many. And I've heard of other companies doing similar. So just um, being able to actually invest in, in black banks. I, again, I don't think that that's the, the answer. I don't think I, we, we need to be relying on philanthropy, but it's, it was still a good outcome. Netflix is actually does other stuff. So Netflix is a content producer. It's not a lender. 
So, and it does produce content that is good. So I, I felt good about working with them on that initiative. Rashern, why don't you take us out here? <laughs> thank, thank you, Dinor. Um, uh, Professor Baradaran, everybody is, you know, chatting, not only on the chat, but also texting me. So you've made me, uh, people appreciate me over here in Maryland. Um, but I did, I didn't want to leave without asking, um, you know, a question around, um, I've heard you talk about public schools and uh, the connection between the wealth gap and property values and funding our education system. And since I know that we have mm -hmm. county executives and mayors and county judges, and for us, that's where we live and die is property values, education, and trying to get people to move in. So I wanted you to, wanted you to talk a little bit about that as, as the closeout question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, I, you know, uh, every, you dig back, a layer of the onion in anything that we have, the tax code, the property codes, anything, and it gets down to, to racism and segregation being the problem here. And if you look at the schools, the way the school funding works and the way that local property taxes work is that you, you get resources based on the property taxes in the area. And you have real, per, you know, districting that keeps resources in these schools. There's a, you know, a new term for it that I've heard, like, you know, the opportunity hoarding, right? So some neighborhoods are able to hoard um, the resources for their kids. And I think, I mean, it goes back to this idea of, you know, our kids and other people's kids. And I think, you know, as a mom of, of three kids, um, you know, I hear this stuff. This is when you go to buy a house, when you go to decide on a school and you choose a private or public school. And I, I will be clear, my kids go to public school in, in, in the neighborhoods that I've been in. And, um, and I, you know, try to pick a, a neighborhood that is as, you know, economically uh, diverse. Um, and my kids haven't suffered because my kids are going to be fine. And it is about the school resources and access and who whose kids you know when people a lot of parents were like well i don't want to send my kids to that school and my response is always like well, whose kids should go to that school right if that school's not good enough for my kids whose kids is it good enough for and then you have to name them like what kind of kids do you think deserve that school and i think that's at the basis of a lot of these things is we have this idea that what's you know, not good enough for my kids is good enough for those other people's kids. And, and I think that needs to go away. And especially when we're talking about kids. And I think this was a COVID um, issue too. And when you hear about kids who are, don't have laptops, who are remote learning, who don't have lunches at school. And I think people are like, well, that's, that's not okay, right? That's not okay. And I think a lot of parents, we make these decisions and um, uh, we make the decisions on where to buy homes and what, what you know, the activities that, that we uh, engage in in our uh, uh, private schools. And I think this is where it gets personal for people, you know, um, and, and I, 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 I usually don't like this part in the conversation because people do start to shift because you say, you know, well, you know, well, I, I want to send my kids to private school. Well, yes, I understand that. You know, I understand that need, um, but then, then we should just fix that system. And uh, so that we don't have to have that, that those resources going out so we can taxes we can if we are not going to integrate kids we can integrate taxes so every school gets the same dollars so we can hire the same amount of teachers and the same resources and then we'll get there no i, I think that uh, that's a great answer the reason I, I i heard you answer the question before and the reason i think it's so important especially for those who are leading cities counties um is that you know especially in this new error that we're in and everyone's you know has woken up and everyone's you know wants to move forward but the question for executives you know uh is what are you willing to give up and part of the giving up is just what you said about our public school systems um you know if you're a county executive like county executive Pittman or the county executive in West Chester County really the value of your county is based on your public school system so if you had a great public school system, your property values are up. If you have a struggling public school system, and I was, you know, county executive of Prince George's County, which is the wealthiest African American county in the country, but yet our property values compared to someplace else was was less because of the makeup of the, of the school. And I think 
having people realize that part of that is we're going to have to give up something if we're going to make the changes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I appreciate the book you've written. Mm -hmm. um, I actually was going after the other book, how the other half bank, because I like those ideas, but it's, it's a brilliant book. And, and thank you for, for being with us tonight. Dean thank Orleans. you so much. And thank you, Rashern, for inspiring the conversation tonight, to Aisha Washington for making it all happen, and especially to Professor Baradaran for a, a, a truly uh, exciting evening. I think, truth be told, you are tr actually a policy professor uh, masquerading as a law professor. So <laughs> Don't say anything. <laughs> you're welcome in, in our thank family you. anytime. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks, Thanks very much for joining. Thank you.